Hey, welcome. I'm Pastor John Boyacek, and this is Fairview Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us for a slice of what Fairview life is all about. We want you to be here and be part of what God is doing in this community. We're thankful today to have God's servant to our heart, uh, Chris Brown. Chris Brown, he is the Canadian director for Christians Against Poverty, but I don't think he's Canadian. And you're going to find that in a minute. But uh, he's going to come share with us what God's put on his heart and the ministry of Christians Against Poverty, a ministry that we've uh, recently partnered with. And I, I think he'll stir our hearts towards their ministry. Well, it is a privilege to be here with you this morning to share with you the heart and vision of the work of Christians Against Poverty, which I know some of you will know about. The Cat Money course has been running here in this church, uh, led by Michael Scott. Um, but I want to talk to you really about our other programs and our other services, but to use God's Word to help explain why we do what we do. As Pastor John said, you can tell I'm, I am from the UK. I have a strong British accent. In fact, I once went to a church and they, some people came up to me afterwards and said, we didn't have a clue what you were saying. <laughs> but your accent was so lovely that we were inspired anyway. <laughs> so my hope this morning is that no matter what, hopefully you will be inspired, whether it's by my accent or led by the Spirit of God. It was in the UK 10 years ago now that I came across the work of Christian Christians Against Poverty. My wife and I had moved from London where I grew up, up to Yorkshire, which is where she was from. And I heard about this organization. And I went on their website, I ordered a copy of this book, nevertheless written by our founder. And as I read it, I knew then immediately that I had to be involved in this ministry in some way or other. And, and a job opening came up and I ended up starting to work for CAP on the 1st of September, 2008. And I was so inspired and encouraged by what they were doing, partnering with churches, not just to provide practical support for people that were trapped in their burden of poverty, but combining that with the spiritual support of going into people's homes and explaining that Jesus loves them. Not shying away from the life-transforming good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I ended up working in a number of different roles there. And the, for the last five years of my time at CAP in the UK, I was the director of services overseeing over 600 partnerships with churches that we had in the UK with a large team of people that were supporting um, to make that happen. And then one day I made the mistake of praying. <laughs> and as I did that, I very simply said, look, I've got to have a wonderful life here in the UK, a wonderful church community that we were a part of, a wonderful job, a wonderful family, a wonderful home. And however, Lord, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go, as long as it's in the UK. <laughs> and the response I got back from God was a different response to what I was expecting. And God said to me, I want you to be prepared to lay everything down that you have here and be willing to go where I'm going to send you to serve CAP internationally. And that was a complete shock to me. I hadn't been expecting it at, at all. And I went and spoke to my wife that night. I thought, well, this is pretty big news. I better, better share it with my wife. <laughs> and she said to me, I'm, oh, finally, at last, you've heard from God. <laughs> She, as a young girl, knew that she would end up moving abroad to serve God as she grew up. And then she met me and thought, well, this guy's never going to leave the UK, but God will get him eventually. And God did eventually get me. And so it was just a wonderful confirmation that my wife had already heard from God. She'd never told me that. And then when I heard from God, it was the right timing for us to, to lay it all down and be willing to go where God wanted us. And then towards the end of 2016, an opportunity arose here in Canada for an executive director and so I was asked to, to, to kind of put my name forward for that. And as I did so, was interviewed by the board over here. And heartily, heartily they agreed that they wanted me here, which was good, because uh, that was what we'd heard from God as well. And so we arrived as a family. We sold our house on the, well, we sold our house at the end of 2016 and moved over here on the 12th of January uh, 2017. Um, 
to what I was told at the time was a mild Canadian winter. <laughs> There's no such thing as a mild... Is this working? It's not working right. There we go. So uh, this was us, I think, outside Tiffany or Webster's Falls in, uh, in Hamilton. And uh, yeah, there was, it was rather a shock to arrive from a typical British winter, which is kind of just rain um, and drizzle, to a very, very cold winter, although mild by Canadian standards. <laughs> I think last winter uh, that we just had more than made up for it. Um, but anyway, yeah, we were, we were very encouraged to be here. Um, and really, in this whole process, God had, as he had spoken to me about it, he had given me such a passion for this nation. He birthed in me a real heart for this nation and a heart for the church in this nation, a heart to see the church equipped with the practical tools necessary to be able to rise up and be light in their community and good news in their community. And the good news is, just a couple of weeks ago, we got our permanent residency. So we're now here to stay, which is great news. We also came over with our two boys at the time, Josiah, who is eight, who is actually, he was here with me this morning. Uh, Gideon is nearly four, and we had our third child just three months ago, Ezekiel, uh, another little baby boy. So do pray for me in a house of boys. Let me tell you a story. Back in the early 90s, there was a successful businessman. He had a house, lovely house, lovely car. He was making money. Through the world's eyes, he looked like he was a success. Married, two children. And then almost overnight, he lost everything when the UK was hit by a recession. He would go to a grocery store with the small amount of change that he could scrape together. And he would often know that he'd have to go days each week without eating so that his children could eat instead. He ended up losing his home. He slept for a period in his car. He ended up losing his marriage because of debt, because of the effects of poverty in his life. And through that time, he was supported by a local church. He wasn't a Christian at the time. And the local church got involved And the local church leader would invite him to events at church and provide food parcels and just help him through and love him in practical ways. And then one evening around the church leader's dinner table, this guy heard the gospel preached. And he immediately knew that God was drawing him into a relationship with him. And he gave his heart and his soul and his life to Jesus Christ. He was continued to be supported by the church as he was discipled. He was baptized I think we've got a picture of him here being baptized. And he started to be able to rebuild his life because of the support of the local church, because of the love of the local church. And then, just as he was starting to to kind of get things back to an even keel, God spoke to him. And in the midst of the crisis, This guy had cried out to God and said, if you get me through this, I will do anything that you ask. And so God said, remember that prayer? Well, here's what I ask, that you would start an organization to help the poor, to help people who have been through what you've been through and going through what you've been through, but who don't know who to turn to. And so in 1996, this guy started an organization. And that guy is a good friend of mine. His name is John Kirkby and he's the founder of Christians Against Poverty. And from the start of CAP, in each country that we operate in, we now operate in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and we've been here in Canada for five years. And early next year, CAP are launching into the States. They're sending a team out from the UK to go and pioneer and start the work there. But every every country we've been to, and from the very beginning, we've had the exact same mission, the same heart, the same DNA that flows through everything that we do. And that is to serve the poor, save the lost, with the church, across the nation. Serve the poor, save the lost, with the church, across the nation. 
And what I want to do this morning is just to walk you through this mission statement and unpack it for you to help you understand more of the heartbeat behind this work. Luke 14, serving the poor. Luke 14, verse 12 to 14. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. There's two things in particular I love about this passage. Firstly, it's calling us to prioritize the poor. It doesn't say that we can't have some nice things in our lives. It doesn't say that we can't have a a home that we own or a car that we own. It doesn't say that we can't have some friends and relatives around for a nice Christmas meal or a Thanksgiving meal. But what this passage is saying Where are the poor in our list of priorities? It's calling us as the church, as the body and the bride of Jesus Christ to reassess the priorities in our lives as the the followers of Jesus Christ. What is his heart? And as we read through scripture, his heart, we see very clearly that for the poor, the needy, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the orphan, the widow, the alien, We see so clearly God's heart and he's calling us to do the same thing and to live the same life. A life sold out, dedicated to serving those around us that are less fortunate than ourselves. And so he's calling us here to prioritize the poor. But secondly here we see a change of narrative in this scripture. It starts off when you give a luncheon or dinner. A luncheon or dinner is a fairly basic meal. And then it switches halfway through when he's talking about But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. In other words, don't just give the poor a luncheon or dinner. Give them a banquet. Don't just give them the average of what you can give them. Give them the very, very best. The poor, the needy are so often let down by society. They're so often not able to access the best quality services available. So why shouldn't we as the church give them God's very best There is a call here for us. We read in in Acts, the early church sold their land, their property, possessions, in order to give to those that had need. And they would bring that resource, they would bring that wealth to the disciples so that the disciples could give out to anyone that had need. And at the end of Acts 4, there's a very, very interesting and powerful line. And it says very simply, there were no needy persons among them. There were no needy persons among them. And I believe the reason is because of the obedience of the followers of Jesus Christ that gave what God had given to them and brought that to the church to be able to help meet the needs of the community. There were no needy persons among them. Isaiah 58 says, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will quickly appear. Then, then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with a pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always and he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets 
with dwellings. I believe that this is a wonderful picture of what the church can be today. There's so many times we see that this is God's heart. In, in Hebrews it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore we know God's heart is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. And what we read about in the God of the yesterday in Scripture is exactly the same today. A heart that beats for the, for the needy, for the downtrodden, for the poor, for the marginalized. If, there are many times we read here, if, if you do this, and then God responds with, then I will do this. If you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry. The original translation of that line is translated as, if you draw out thy soul to the hungry. If you draw out thy soul to the hungry. In other words, if we are willing to give all that we are, all that God has given us, everything that we are is for a reason, it's for a purpose. A God-given destiny to change this world one life at a time. To lead people to an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. If we give of everything that we've got, if we draw out our souls for those that are less fortunate than ourselves, if you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will break forth like the dawn. A picture of Jesus. A picture of Jesus moving and revival. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. In this community, in Lindsay, there are many, many dwellings. There are many streets, but there's much devastation. There's much brokenness. And God desires to bring restoration to this community to dwellings, to homes, to families. And that's where we as the church step in. This is what we are here to do. And it's a promise from God, as we do our bit, then you will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. The promise is there. God wants us to have the poor in our lives, in our homes, in our hearts, in our churches. He is calling us to be the church that he intended us to be, a church that is willing to spend ourselves, inviting the poor to our banquets and giving our time and our resources to serve those less fortunate. There is hope. There is hope. The new tagline that we have as an organization is always hope. Because we believe when we're partnering with the church, When the body and the bride of Jesus Christ are being obedient, then there is always hope for this community, for the broken in this community, for families that are being torn apart. There is always hope. The second part of our mission statement is to save the lost. What? Let me just clarify that for a moment. I'm not saying that we save the lost. Salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. But we believe that evangelism is a partnership between us and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is drawing people closer to the person of Jesus, drawing people closer to the reality of who he is and what he's done for them. But the Holy Spirit also lives within us for a reason. The Holy Spirit empowers us, gives us strength and boldness and courage to step out of our comfort zone and to proclaim the good news of Jesus. We believe, therefore, about being intentional with evangelism as an organization. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor. This was the passage that Jesus, when he stands up in the the temple, he is handed the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he reads this section out. And there's no coincidence This was Jesus commissioning his ministry. For the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor. And we are called to do the same works that Jesus did. It actually says in scripture that we will do even greater things. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us 
to preach good news to the poor. Matthew 28, a passage known as the Great Commission. Not the Great Suggestion, the Great Commission. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. A very clear call for each and every one of us to go. There's action involved. To go means to get up off our blessed backsides and to move out of our comfort zone and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and to make disciples to teach people in the ways of Jesus Christ. And surely, he is with us always to the very end of the age. And then my particular favorite, Romans 10, verse 13, says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we could all collectively say, amen. But it doesn't stop there. When we read it in context, it goes on to verse 14 that says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them we desire for our friends for our family for our community to come to know Jesus Christ we desire to see revival in our community to see this church packed with people worshipping Jesus Christ but there's a responsibility on us to preach the good news. And that is what we do as an organization. We don't just do social action, i.e. helping someone with their practical needs. We combine that with evangelism, helping people with their spiritual needs because we believe in the holistic whole transformation in someone's life. And it's why last year as an organization we saw 23 of our clients come to know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Because this thing is and always will be ultimately about leading people to the life-transforming person of Jesus. The third part of our mission statement is to do this with the church. The reality is we can't do our second part, saving the lost, without the third part. We believe that when we work with the local church, it's there that we can see true transformation happening in someone's life. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church has always been God's plan A. There is no other plan. And that's why we want to work with the church. The body, the bride of Jesus Christ. The local church is the hope of the world. The church is a place that welcomes and comforts the brokenhearted. The church is a place that is willing to surround and lift up the grieving and downtrodden. The church is the place that builds up its members to send them out on the mission field. The church is the place that takes the great commission of Jesus Christ seriously. The church is the place that is the family and community to so many that have never experienced that. Nothing will destroy the church because it's been built on the rock of Jesus Christ and he has the victory and then lastly our mission statement is to do this across the nation we believe that this gift that God has given to us is not just for a few communities but for every community across Canada because every community is struggling with devastating needs and challenges people struggling in poverty, in debt, with unemployment. 50% of Canadians worry about their finances. And maybe some people here in this room, and that's, that's you, and that's okay, and there are some things that we can do to help you. 33% of Canadians are struggling to pay their bills. One in five children in Canada live in poverty. 42% of Canadians would struggle to survive if their paycheck was delayed by just one week. Unemployment has hit 6% recently with 1.4 million Canadians out of work. And 39% of, of unemployed people have given up hope of ever being employed again. 
the needs are devastating. The effects that that has in people's lives is horrendous. 27% of our clients said that debt had caused their relationship to break down entirely. 27% families are being torn apart because of debt and poverty. 25% of clients missed meals on a regular basis. One in four of the homes that we go to, there is no food in the cupboards at all. And I don't just mean there's a few tins. There is nothing. I've been there in people's homes where they have nothing at all. And as an organization, we'll then go and fill up their cupboards and the fridge for them because we want to bless them and help them as they start their journey out of debt. I once remember taking a client after the visit to the grocery store and we got some food for her. And as we took the food back to her house, she said, why would you do this for us? Why would you do this for me? And that was a great op opportunity for me to say, we're doing it because God has first loved us and he's asking us to love you. And he desires you to know him. She went to church the following week and she gave her life to Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do. Another client that we went to, she had no food in the cupboards and we went and took them out. It was her and a, a seven-year-old daughter. We took them grocery shopping and when they got back, they filled up the fridge and the cupboards and the mum turned to the daughter and said, why don't you choose what you want to eat tonight? And this little seven-year-old girl said, no, mummy, let's just look at it. That's the reality for so many families. Finding food, going days without food, has become the norm for so many people. But we can do something about that. And then 38% of, of our clients have seriously considered suicide as the only way out of debt. It's heartbreaking. The amount of pastors that I've spoken to that have said that they've conducted funerals for someone that committed suicide because of debt, because they didn't know if there would be a way out of it and that was the only thing that they could think to do, to end it all, to end the shame, to end the misery, to end the guilt. And we can do something about that. And so what is it that we actually do? There are three programs that we run as an organization. The first is something called the Cap Money Course, which I mentioned earlier and has been running here in the church led by Michael Scott and was, as, as Pastor John said this morning, there's a course coming up on the 22nd uh, of October, starting for three weeks. Now, the, re the reality is the Cat Money course is a basic but revolutionary finance course. It doesn't go into high-level things like investments. The reality is that 50% of Canadians don't have a budget. Therefore, we want to start with the basics. So the, the course talks about building a budget, getting it to balance, and then spending wisely. And we, it's a three-week course with six hours of material, and there's, you can you do a budget on paper, you can do a budget online, and you can manage that afterwards. It's very, very accessible, whether you've got advanced understanding of managing money or no understanding of managing money, and for any age, it is applicable. And so if you haven't been along to one of the courses here yet, I would really urge you and encourage you to go along. Even if you manage your money well, one of the great things is you can go along, and then you can invite some friends and family to come along to the next one that's running. And you could say firsthand that you've experienced it and you know how good it is. So do give that some consideration. The second thing that we do as an organization is a program called Debt Centers. And this is the flagship of what we do. It's the main thing that we've done for the last 22 years since we started in 1996. A cap debt center enables a church to reach some of the poorest people in the community that are struggling with severe unmanageable debt. A debt center operates in partnership with a local church. We do everything in partnership with a local church. And the debt center goes into clients' homes in that community that are struggling. And we provide a completely free service to support them on that sometimes very long journey of getting out of debt. This year, we've seen three families, more than, more than three families go debt free, but one was helped five years ago. She's been on that journey with us for five years. Another two families that were, have gone debt free this year have been working with us for four years. So sometimes it's a very long journey of working towards debt freedom. And we don't pay any clients' debts for them. All the money that goes towards paying off their debts is their own money that we encourage, that we, we create a budget for them, we show them how much they need to pay into the cap plan, 
and then we disperse all the funds for them on their behalf. So we can track how they're working towards that debt-free moment. We do the credit counselling centrally in our head office in Hamilton. We have a team there that are qualified to be able to create the budget and negotiate with creditors, demand justice, get the creditors to back off and stop harassing them, and to provide that breathing space for the client. And we have over 93% of our clients stay debt-free after they've gone debt-free with us. And considering these are some of the poorest people in society, that figure is really stunning. We've seen hydro disconnections stopped, evictions stopped, as we've been able to negotiate on the client's behalf and prevent any action, negative action from happening for them. And we're delighted that recently we were accredited for our credit counselling work by the Canadian Association of Credit Counselling Services. And their CEO, Henrietta Ross, said this about us. I'm very proud to be associated with CAP Canada, a truly amazing organisation that genuinely cares about the most vulnerable among us by helping them in a dignified way and with the utmost of love and respect. CAP's unique approach in supporting clients through home visits is refreshing and extremely helpful in gaining a first-hand appreciation of the family's challenging circumstances. This extent of CAP's dedicated support for a family's well-being is unparalleled in Canada today. And that is a non-Christian CEO of a secular organization overseeing credit counseling here in Canada that's saying that about a Christian organization working in partnership with a local church. And the reality is that you and I, we can look at it and we know that the reason it's unparalleled is because the gospel is at the heart of it. Because Christ is at the center of all that we do. And then the last of our services that is it's still in the pilot stage at the moment, but this is a service called CAP Job Clubs. And this is designed as a program to help people that are trapped in the cycle of unemployment. CAP Job Clubs are designed to equip people with practical tools necessary to find employment while rebuilding their confidence and self-esteem in the process. The service is aimed at reaching marginalized, long-term unemployed. We've sometimes helped people that have been unemployed for 26 years or more that then find work because someone's got alongside them and said, we believe in you, we love you, and we're going to walk you through on this journey. Forget what the world says about you. What does God say about you? And so over 30% of people going through a CAP job club are finding work, which compared to other equivalent schemes is a very high number. And the course runs, it's an eight-week course with regular coaching and regular community time that work, runs alongside that course, helping people in the community. If there's anything this morning that any of the programs that I've spoken about that you are feeling a bit of a nudge from God to get involved or if you're feeling I, this thing, Christians Against Poverty, it's really resonating with me more, then do chat to me at the end. I'm going to be at the stand in the back. Do chat to Pastor John as well if you're thinking this is something that you want to actively get involved in maybe running a job club or helping Michael Scott with the Cat Money course or maybe even with the Debt Centre. Do come and chat to us after you afterwards. Now, I could be here for a long time talking about the work of CAP. I love what I do, and so I could passionately talk about it for hours on end, but I know you've all got your lunches to go back to. So before we finish, there's two things I want to do. Firstly, I want to give you a gift. Now, when you sat, in, sat here this morning on your chairs, you'd have found a form that looks something like this. Have you all got one of those forms? So if you just want to grab one of those forms, and there's a scattering of pens nearby as well. Um, you can grab a pen. The reality is, you're already, as a church, involved with this work running Cat Money Course, and I know the church are exploring further ways to partner with us as an organization to help people in this community. And so I think it's essential that you know more about this work and know more about the heartbeat of who, this, who we are. This book, nevertheless, is a gift I want to give to you this morning for free. It's written by our founder, John Kirkby. It was kind of really based on his diary he kept for many years without telling anyone. And it starts off with him finding faith in Jesus Christ and rebuilding his life and then the journey of Cap starting in the UK from a £10 donation and many people saying to him, you'll be a failure, you should be responsible and get a real job to look after your family. But nevertheless, John knowing this was something God had called him to do and then all the way through to even recently, uh, you can see the growth, the phenomenal, miraculous growth of CAP in the UK and the growth of the impact and what God really is doing throughout the world now. John was recently awarded a couple of months ago a CBE by the Queen 
in the UK, which is a commander of the British Empire Award, the second highest civilian award that can be offered. And that was given because of his services for the, helping the poor in the UK. And it, even recently, just to give you some idea of the size and scale of the work of CAP in the UK, and what we are aiming towards and driving towards here in Canada, they, were, they had a documentary and the BBC came and did a 16-week filming tour with John and Cap, and that was aired on Friday night, uh, just gone, um, or last Friday night, should I say, at 9 p.m., primetime TV in the UK. Two million people learning that Cap is all about evangelism, that Cap is all about praying for people, inviting people to church, and seeing lives completely transformed. And it's a wonderful thing. Um, if you look online, you might be able to, to, to see it, but that just gives you some idea of the, the scale of what this work really is. And so this book has some wonderful stories in it, some wonderful faith-building stories. And I want you to have a copy of this for free this morning. You will be blessed and encouraged as you read this. All I need you to do with the forms that you've got is as you open it up on the first page, you'll see contact details. If you just fill out that page, and then you can bring the form to me at the stand, and I'll give you a copy of the book for free. And then what I also want to do is to talk to you about how else you can get involved. So... If you're thinking about getting involved practically and you're thinking you want to give some time towards this, as I said, do come and chat to us. Come and chat to Pastor John or myself. I also want to talk to you about how you can get involved in, an, in a different way. Now, the reality is we are Christians against poverty, which means we don't shy away from proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. We are intentional about sharing the good news, about sharing the incredible life-transforming love of God. And so we don't receive government or secular funding for the work that we do. We believe God has called us to keep the gospel at the heart of what we are doing. And so our funding, as it has been since day one, is through Christians, through individuals that are passionate about our work, that have a heart for the poor and needy, and are willing to support with a few dollars every month. And we need more people willing to join us by supporting us through a regular monthly donation so that we can partner with more churches, hopefully being able to partner here with you at Fairview Baptist to help more people struggling in poverty. I was speaking at a church recently where we've had a debt center for the last three years. And at the end, a guy came up to me and with tears streaming down his face, he said to me that his life is completely transformed because of Cap and the local church supporting him and loving him. He was in debt, he was far from God, and his life was a mess, but the local church and CAP got involved. He's practically, he's now on his way out of debt. But more importantly than that, he started attending church. He gave his life to Jesus Christ last year and he got baptized last year. And a year on, he's still there and he's serving now. And that completely made my year. I've had a bit of a challenging year personally. And as I heard his story, it made everything completely worthwhile. Even if it was just one life. Even if it was just one person that completely transformed, it was absolutely worth it. But we want to see more like that. We want to see more transformation like that. And that's where you come in. So we have an exciting plan over the next three years to partner with more churches, to open 30 new debt centers, to open 15 new job clubs, and to have 250 churches running the Cap Money course at the end of that period of time. But we can't do it without you. And even though I've just, those, those figures are not about figures for the sake of figures, it's about lives. It's about people that we can help in those churches. The average monthly donation that we receive is $30 a month. However, every dollar makes a huge difference. And so this morning, my main ask is actually this. Could you spare $5 a month to support the work of CAP? If you could give more than that and you feel led to give more than that, then please feel free. But my main ask is this, could you, could you give just $5 a month to help us as an organization go and help and partner with more churches to help more people and change one life at a time? And I'm asking not for me or even for Cap, but I'm asking for the poor and needy that we can go and help with that generosity. And so if this morning you feel led to be able to give $5 a month, then what I want you to do is on the back of the form, you'll notice there's a section where you can fill out details to give financially. You can give through credit card giving, through pre-authorized debit. Um, if you don't know your details, there is a box where you can tick to say you want to give, 
and one of our team can give you a call over the next few days to take that information over the phone instead. So thank you so much, church, for having me here to share with you more about this ministry. Thank you, Pastor John and team. And it's been a real privilege to, to share with you God's heart for the poor. And thank you for all that you are doing here in this community. So as we finish, I encourage you to start filling out your forms. We're just going to watch a short uh, video clip with some of our client stories. I always felt alone. It's uh, something that uh, consumes you, a nightmare. It was almost like uh, drowning in quicksand. I didn't know what to do. I felt very isolated, very ashamed. I actually uh, got very, very depressed. Maybe it would be better if I didn't wake up tomorrow morning just because of how much debt I was in. I got myself into a real jam with credit cards. Daily, I would get so many phone calls and I stopped answering the phone for a while, which just made matters worse. Then came the threats for lawyers. It was like each one of them had a shovel and they were digging a deeper and deeper and deeper hole for me that I couldn't, it was taking away the light from my life and the hope. It got to a point where I couldn't pay anymore. I just, even the minimums I couldn't handle. All I thought about 24-7 was how am I going to get out of this mess. So it just kind of progressively got into a cycle I just couldn't get out of. Then I found CAP. It took me three weeks to even work up the courage to be able to call them. And I was just worried that I was going to be so judged. That first phone call uh, uh, to CAP actually was uh, it was a help right off the start. I didn't feel like I was being judged. She understood my situation and uh, she gave me some hope that uh, Cap could help me out with this. And uh, for the first time, I actually felt like somebody was on my team. When I called Cap, I finally felt listened to. Cap accepted me for who I was. I felt as though I was normal. The best part about Cap is not having to deal with the creditors and being able to have them speak to CAP representatives instead of constantly calling me. CAP has made a big difference in, uh, in, in my life. They became a buffer between the creditors and myself because I, I really had no solution. When um, I started uh, working with Christians Against Poverty, I was able to see how God still cared about me and that He was there with me every step of the way as well. I realize now that without Him, I would still be in that big financial mess. I don't even know if I would have still been here, to be honest. Cap brings scripture to life. I can see God working through Cap, and that is and has been very important and very dear to me. The practical support that I received from CAP, the availability, um, whenever I had questions or I needed to talk to CAP, uh, there was always uh, people there to take my call. The other thing that I gained from CAP was an introduction to church. I noticed that CAP, you know, like they're godly people helping others. And I could learn a lot from that. I spent a lot of time in my life being selfish, not helping other people as much as I could have. Now I start to see the worth in it, and uh, I want to be like that. I feel much better and much more confident and much more serene, which is important to me because I live with a lot of anxiety and things like that, and um, that seems to be washed away by Jesus. I'm just giving my will over to the Lord because of all this. And it, it all started with the debt and cap, and, and, and you know, it's uh, mushroomed into this uh, great things for me. I would like to thank anybody who's made any kind of a donation. You are really doing a good work. You are participating in God's plan, and you are helping so many people. There are people going debt-free because Christians Against Poverty has taken the time to do this for us. Thank you for being Christians Against Poverty. Thank you for being Christians Against Poverty. Thank you for being Christians Against Poverty.
Hey, you know what? We are a community that loves Jesus, and we want you to be part of this. Feel free to give us a call or even drop us an email. We'd love to hear from you.